welcome to Jurassic Park 3 Minute, where we will be discussing the second Jurassic Park sequel one minute at a time. I'm Brad. I'm Dave. And today we're back to discuss Minute 10 of Jurassic Park 3, but before we get to that, David, some sad news recently. We've uh, been following the restoration of the Lost World RV for some time, mm-hmm. nearly all the way back to when it was first discovered and sold on eBay, but uh, this last week we got notification through that uh, it's actually sold and being shipped off to Japan, where... Um, looking at uh, the new owners, they seem to be um, a company or the company that run the Tokyo Comic Con. Mm-hmm. They've already got some iconic vehicles in their possession. Oh, do they? Yeah. Frank, the current owner of the RV and the, the one that uh, runs the uh, restoration page, has been throwing up some images, uh, one of the new owners that are on Facebook. And uh, they've got the bus from Speed, which... Mm. It's just another... People, there's been a lot of complaints about the RV being sold overseas and not being put up for auction in local local fan groups and that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Frank Frank said that, that he put a lot more... like a, It sold for a lot more than what he purchased it for when it was rotting out in the desert. And I could have just seen if he'd put it to the fans, fans would have been squabbling. And mm-hmm. and even, even if they could afford to pay for it, they might not have been able to afford to keep it or house it or just keep looking after it, which would have been a real shame. But at least going over there, it's um, they've got the bus from speed, and they've got the facilities to keep it undercover by the looks of it as well. And even if it's not restored anymore, it should stay in pretty good condition, apart from <laughs> rotting in the Californian desert. So, But they've also got the... Um, they've just got an order in, of, or just got new, some new uh, vehicles in, one being the Harley that Arnold Schwarzenegger rides in Terminator 2. Mm-hmm. And they've got Mr. Bean's original Mini, <laughs> Morris, <laughs> Morris Mini in as well. So that's just um, that's just some of the photos they've showed on their Facebook page. So I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more vehicles they've got in their collection over there, but it's just good that they're an actual vehicle collector mm-hmm. um, going after movie movie accurate stuff. And if they can house something like the bus from Speed, then they'll quite easily be able to house and look after the RV as well. Yeah. Well, my main worry was that it, we would actually never see it again because, I mean... It's no secret that the Japanese can be rather secretive about this kind of stuff. And it's just thankful that it's being sent to a Comic-Con owner and not just like a private collector in Japan where it'll disappear into mass size of the private collection and never be seen again, you know? Yeah. Well, and that's and that's definitely something that you'd think could happen because the amount of times movie props cars all that sort of stuff gets sold off into um into private collections and as you said they just disappear from the public view altogether mm-hmm. and it's sort of, it's sort of one of the things like the, the the current state of the rv and frank said in a couple of his videos that he was only getting back once or twice a year to be able to do things with it and wasn't sure how or what state it'd be in when he got back to california just because it was being again being left out in the open mm-hmm. They did get the roof sealed, but there was still a lot of work to do on it, and it was never, it was never in as a as a screen used, and they were restoring it as screen accurate. It was never going to be able to tour the country with those big tires, with the current engine that's in it. It was built for a prop to be used on screen, and that was it. You, well, you only see the the issues he had trying to get it to Universal for the meetup a couple of months ago. Yeah, exactly. And that's just a few hundred miles if that down the down the highway that's not going across the rockies and <laughs> over to montana or over to the, the west coast or east coast as well so it was never going to never really going to tour the country and like people sort of holding off for it to tour the country and never going to actually see it mm-hmm. well it's and now it's just as far away being in japan as it would be from one side of the country to the other if if you couldn't afford or couldn't get to the other side of the country to see it then you're probably not gonna be able to get across the ocean to see it as well but at least, um, at least when these Comic Con events are on, you should still be able to see photos of it. And hey, they might even have some progress images as well as they keep on doing work to it. We'll just need it translated because <laughs> their Facebook page is in Japanese. <laughs> but it's just like that that bus from Speed's another thing. It's just something that a prop from a iconic prop from a movie that probably disappeared from the fans' eyes. Now I haven't been up, I haven't been keeping up to date with the Speed fan clubs and everything else, but. You'd assume something like that probably would have disappeared and people would have forgot where it was or what had ever happened to it. And here it is being kept in a collection and being kept um, in good condition. 
it's just like the RV when it when it sort of finished filming it done its tour and then just disappeared as it got sold off to that guy who had it in the desert and it sort of fell out of fans eyes and then all of a sudden when it come up for sale that's when fans sort of got back on board with it again and followed along with the uh, restoration of it so it could be worse just think that Jurassic Park the yeah the Jurassic Park Raptor cage is still out in the desert he wouldn't sell that and yeah. it is rotting away <laughs> just because he uh, he wanted to keep it and not not sell it so oh so he did end up keeping that yeah the 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 owner the the guy who had the rv he still owns that raptor cage it's still out there where the rv was found they um he wouldn't he refused to sell it Mm -hmm. so i do remember the um rv or not the raptor yeah the raptor cage ending up on an ebay auction but i didn't know that it didn't sell i just it had sold no, that might have been that might have it might have it might have sold. This was back when they were um, getting the RV off the property. Uh, they yeah. they also asked him then if they could take it, and he wouldn't sell it then. So, I think that Raptor cage was definitely after yeah. after the RV was found and sold. But because mm-hmm. there are images that I have in my collection from the um, eBay sale of that Raptor cage. Yeah, yeah, and it's sort of it's not just these sort of props as well like famously the um i think it was the the landing craft from alien mm-hmm. was um kept under a tarp in someone's driveway like the big the big anima oh, not animatronic the miniature <laughs> if you want to call it a miniature it's it's like nine oh nine meters long or something but <laughs> the massive the massive miniature they used for alien for that landing craft mm-hmm. was just someone had kept it and it was living under a tarp in a garage in a driveway just rotting away because that fan wanted it so much but didn't have the facilities to house it or look after it until it was finally purchased back by um by someone and restored again and now it's sort of in a museum where people can see it so ben burt maybe yeah that sounds familiar because uh, i know that he had the original alien queen head yeah and yeah. loved it out in 1997 the makers of alien resurrection and then got mad that they repainted it (laughs) (laughs) oops yeah don't do that again i'm sorry i lose you it's just me and the damn tourists back on topic a little bit uh this week i got the uh drake jurassic park free novelization in and quickly went to a couple of key scenes in it that i wanted to see if anything was different and um they weren't really mainly around the lab and aviary but uh a couple of things that were um, different. I'm not going to recap the whole last 10 minutes that um, is in it, but it sort of it opens with Eric and Ben already in the air. We don't get the sort of initial arrival at Sauna or the, the mm-hmm. them going up in the parasail, but there's a little bit of backstory that's added to the prologue there, which I thought was interesting. It says, uh, several years ago, genetic engineers had brought dinosaurs back to life here, hoping to create a sort of dinosaur zoo, but Jurassic Park had never opened to the public. A number of accidental deaths had spooked the owners, and Costa Rican and UN or United Nations authorities had declared both islands, uh, both Isla Sauna and its compa- companion island, Isla Nublar, a no-fly and no-boating zone. So it's sort of Nublar is mentioned as being also included in this no-fly and mm-hmm. restricted area. That's interesting. I did not know this. Yeah. So that, that and that's on the like the opening page. As um as Eric's sort of up in the plane up in the parasail and looking at Sauna, he's sort of rem- rem- remembering about hearing several years ago that or hearing about the Jurassic incident, which is sort of it's it's funny that it's described as a number of accidental deaths where they s- most of them weren't really accidental. Gennaro's was an accident sort of, but <laughs> <laughs> most of them were people just got eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I just found found interesting that um. Both the Costa Rican government and the United Nations authorities had declared both islands no-fly, no-boating zones, so that could uh, explain a little bit why uh, nothing's happening on Nubla at the moment either. But yeah, it also the boats the boats described as heading out to the open sea and not crashing into rocks or a reef too. That's why they cut loose and fly back or float mm. back to the island. Oh, well, there is one thing to keep in mind is that there was the reveal from the DPG where. And as well as the Maserani website that Maserani had acquired um, Injun after the in the San Diego incident, which I think had been assumed by the fans at that point that Injun was going to be completely totaled um, 
they they wouldn't be coming back from anything after the uh, <laughs> after the San Diego incident. So it was revealed that they were in fact sold and bought up by Masrani, who then authorized the illegal cloning on. Well, Masrani didn't, but there then there was the illegal cloning under Ingen on Isla Sorna that brought us the Spinosaurus. Mm. And then there was the, um, then I think Jurassic World actually opened a few years, I think it was 2005 Jurassic World opened. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's interesting that InGen had already been tampering with Isla Sorna in that time, and they had already, um, and they were already opening a park three years after this incident. Well, yeah, and being three years away from that incident, that uh, or from here, that um, there's definitely construction that have to be happening on Nublar right now. If, mm-hmm. if if Jurassic Park had been in construction for three years and knowing how big the facilities were there, like you can only imagine what we're seeing in Jurassic World and how big, <laughs> how much bigger mm-hmm. the island is for visitors and that. That that's got to be at least a five year project <laughs> with a lot of a lot of construction crews on site. But well, at least, yeah. But that is interesting, and sort of it's a shame we don't really know what else InGen does in the film canon anyway, mm-hmm. um, because they, they, man, they managed to survive from Jurassic Park to The Lost World, and yes, in that um, deleted boardroom scene, Ludlow goes through some of the expenditures involved in keeping people quiet and that for, from the Jurassic Park incident, and that, that went into the millions, and you can only imagine what was going to be coming down the pipeline after the San Diego incident from the mm-hmm. government and all the all the deaths there and everything else so it definitely would have been enough to to see them have to sell sell the company and sell the assets out yeah exactly we can get into that a little bit later when we um mm-hmm. start bringing up Maserani again but david you got the uh you got a book too this week i did yes i uh <clears throat> got the lost world annual in the mail which is actually kind of interesting it's like a storybook sort of i think it was only released in the uk mm-hmm it was a storybook. It's like the storybook, but it gets intersected with like little factoids about the dinosaurs and stuff like that. It's kind of interesting. It actually had a bunch of interesting uh, new stills that I haven't seen before. It had one of Carter and Dieter sitting in the jeep, and then another of Eddie outside the outside the RV when he's trying to string it up. Then as well as the uh, there's a couple. There's a couple. I'll, I'll post them up and mm-hmm. share them. And then there's also some really uh, good pictures of the maquettes as well in the dinosaur factoid pages. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's and that's one thing I didn't really mention with the novelization too, because it's of course got the like it's eight pages of color photos in the middle. Just some of these production photos that were in these books and never really put online or anywhere else. We'll get to it when we get towards the end of the film, but there's a there's a still in the book of uh, Eric Kirby standing in front of the driver's cabin of that boat on the river, and the InGen logo being on that boat where I never thought it was previously. You can't see it anywhere in the film, but just a closer look at that prop in daylight and seeing it's also got the InGen logo on it. So <laughs> it's just good little seeing little things like that, and as we'll get a little bit lighter here in the minute too, where they're uh, discussing that the big gun. Um, on one of the websites that have all the information on that, there's a production still too of Nash and Cooper standing beside that gun that I've never seen before as well. So mm-hmm. that's where you're getting a lot of these old books is <laughs> real, real fun. Which I was going to ask: Have you got the comics, the uh, the movie adaptation comics for the Lost World? I have none of the comics. The only thing I actually have is a copy of them that was photocopied by. A friend of mine who sent them to me. Okay. Uh, recently on eBay, I've found a. Um, it must be the trade paperback, which is all the all the volumes of the the movie adaption in it. And uh, mm-hmm. they open up one page, and you can see you know, clearly see like them in the village. So I really want to buy it now to just see if it shines any more light on the inside of the village operations building or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, which it, it probably wouldn't be canon, but if it's the same set. <laughs> It's not really a story change or anything like that, but I'd just be really interested to see. If anyone's got that <laughs> that that comic, please let me know. But um, apart from that, David, ready to get into minute 10? Sure. All right. 
As we ended on minute nine of Jurassic Park 3, we were transitioning from Dr. Grant's lecture at the auditorium to Nash painting a big bullseye on the windscreen of an abandoned aeroplane. As we open up on minute 10, Nash finishes painting the circle on the airplane's windscreen and throws the empty can into the cockpit before jumping down and running back to where Cooper's waiting with a big rifle. At the 10 second mark, Nash kneels down beside Cooper and Cooper asks him, what have we got here, Nashy? Nash then goes into the specifications of the Einhorn 20mm rifle. At the 20 second mark, we cut inside another aeroplane as Udesky goes to answer the satellite phone that's been ringing for some time. On the other end of the line is Paul Kirby, just checking the progress. Udesky tells him that they're ready to go as soon as that last payment comes in. At the 42 second mark, Udesky walks out of the back of the aeroplane, telling Mr Kirby that the two mercenaries he got are the best he could find and even though he hasn't worked with them personally, they come highly recommended. And as the minute ends, Cooper demonstrates the destructive power of the weapon as he shoots the aeroplane with the paint on it, blowing it to pieces. As minute 10 opens, we get our first look at Nash painting what looks like a big red bullseye on a window. Bruce Young bounces from TV to film quite a bit, and he's also a writer. Uh, the only thing I still really recognise him from is Prison Break, but he's also been in a lot more other things including uh, ER and Basic Instinct. And interestingly, his, uh, his last credit before Jurassic Park 3 was uh, the Drew Carey show, which mm-hmm. just sort of shows the range where he's on that sort of comedic sitcom and now he's on a bit of a more serious, or should have been serious, <laughs> movie. But um, it's a shame he sort of goes to this hard mercenary through it all and doesn't really bring out any comedy at all in the film. But it might be just another another issue with the script and not sort of using the c- characters they got at the, in their best abilities. Yeah. But he empties the spray can and throws it in through the open window and we can hear it clanging around as it hits the ground and the camera pulls back to reveal a small plane destroyed by time and uh, red eyes and teeth have been painted on the front of it which sort of give it that um, sort of like that Spitfire, I think it's a Spitfire, look where they have the, like the shark's teeth on the front of the plane. Mm-hmm. even though this is crudely done <laughs> with a red spray can. And it's, it's probably not the intention here, but it's sort of making it look like a big scary beast. <laughs> mm-hmm. Especially with what they're going to do in a minute. I think the intent was kind of like to make it look like a dinosaur. Yeah. But it just really doesn't. <laughs> it just looks like a... Uh, like you said, it looks more like a Spitfire. Hmm. I... <laughs> I don't know, it might happen over there, but I know here, especially um, some people with uh, boats, like small small aluminium boats and that that they put in the rivers, sometimes they get the spray cans out and do something similar to this by <laughs> put it, painting eyes and the shark's teeth on the side of it. I don't know why, maybe just so they hope it goes better in the water or faster in the water or <laughs> stay, <laughs> stay out of my way, I'm a, I'm a predator or something. I but think I, it was just uh, look intimidating. Yeah, yep. Yep, so... Thanks to the um, Internet Movie Planes database, which <laughs> I didn't know existed, this is a Cessna 310 or 310. Mm-hmm. It's it's clearly sort of just an abandoned plane, and as we get Nash here turn and run off screen, we get to see a lot of uh, other planes littering the ground as well, which um, sort of makes it look like a bit of an aer- aer- aeroplane uh, graveyard, but... Mm-hmm. We see a different, lot of different sections there, airplanes sort of spread out, and you can clearly see they've just been spread out as a as a movie set. Like there's no there's no dust or dirt swept up against things. They've just been nicely placed here and there around the set. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is convenient because this was shot um, out past or in Southern California, out near Victorville, uh, Aviation Warehouse, which is a props hire company specialising in plane and plane parts for movies. So. A lot of these, a lot of these sets and or parts of planes have probably been seen in other films as well, mm-hmm. but I couldn't find that information anywhere. <laughs> but we get Ash, uh, uh, Ash Nash uh, ends ends up crouching down beside Cooper um, while holding some big bullets. Cooper asks Nash, "What have we got here, Nashy?" And <laughs> uh, we got before we go into the weapon itself, Cooper here, played by John D De- Hill, De Hill, is it? Dial-in. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for butchering that, but it, it is a hard name. <laughs> um, he's a pretty busy actor as well, and in 2001, when this film was released, he had five other projects or, or films or um, shows that were being released as well, so he's definitely a very busy actor. 
known mainly for playing sort of disturbed or psycho characters, which mm-hmm. is a little bit different to his character here as well. He's, it's not he's pretty talkative and sort of easy going here, but once he gets on the plane and gets in those black levers, he sort of doesn't say a lot. <laughs> he, the funny thing is, is he kind of just... Uh, he's kind of the foil... Or not a really a foil, but he's kind of the uh, partner to um, uh, Nash in a way because... Uh, Nash kind of plays that kind of like silent tough guy, and then Cooper is like the talkative tough guy. Mm. Yeah. You know? Yep. And it's sort of a shame here too, because I've I've got nothing against sort of bringing these mercenaries in. Yes, we sort of seen what happened with uh, mercenaries and Ingen in the Lost World, but mm-hmm. actually bringing bringing a couple of high, oh, I'll say highly skilled, um, <laughs> either ex ex military or mercenaries in sort of isn't a bad idea. The only problem with it is, and as we'll see later, Universal and everyone in charge just will not show some a dinosaur being shot. <laughs> they refuse to show it, so um, you know they've already they've already got red shirts on for the mm-hmm. most part. We, we've we've got Grant, we've got Billy, we've got William H Macy and T Lee, and they're not going to die. So we need we need some dinosaur fodder, and unfortunately, these two guys <laughs> and Udesky are going to be it. Yeah, these guys are. Uh straight down. Uh, the, well, Cooper and Nash are like straight one off characters that are just there to be eaten. Mm. Udesky actually sticks around for a little while, and, yeah, and we'll talk about him more because I do like him. Yeah. Yeah, that's. And we'll, we'll get to it once we get on off the Spinosaur as well, where we don't really have a main. The, the, the Spinosaur is the villain. We don't have human villains wanting to export the island or, or exploit the island or anything like that. And even, even these two aren't really. They paid. They paid to be there to offer their, I'm going to say, protective services for the Kirby's, and um, not really there. The, the weapons are just there for self-defense. Yeah. And looking at this weapon, they obviously know where they're going. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you've got the um, subtitles on, I'm not going to go through the whole of Nash's spiel, <laughs> as you can hear it. But uh, it brings up it's the um, Einhorn 20 millimeter, which um, isn't. A real weapon. It um, mm-hmm. this is this is just a, a re or like a um, a Barrett 50 cal sniper rifle, which has also got a um, a thermal a thermal sight on the top as well. That big big sight's a thermal sight, firing uh, 20 millimeter high explosive incendiary rounds, <laughs> which as you can see when it hits the plane here in a minute, it um, yeah exactly it would have it would have done a good number on the Spinosaur, and we do hear some shots get fired later on in the film, but unfortunately he uh, didn't hit. He's not good at moving targets, it seems. <laughs> Which again, a rifle this big, you're not shooting from the hip. If you're running away from a dinosaur, you got to sort of get down on the tripod, and <laughs> and that's not going to work real well if there's a dinosaur charging at you. Yeah, really. <laughs> as we'll see later in the movie too. Yeah. Yep. I also like that, I do like that he does stop and look at the these giant slugs, I guess you call them. <laughs> um, and he's just smiling at them. He's just like, yeah, I got toys. Yeah, yep. And it's sort of, it's they've, they've obviously been, or Sammy been funded for this expedition and been able to go out and buy this new toy and um, mm-hmm. Nash giving the uh, the techno babble spiel as he does sort of shows up that he's um, he must be the sort of the weapons expert or something, even though it's not really said here in the film. But, yeah, they're just excited to have new toys, and especially when they get to fire it as well. Mm-hmm. But as uh, as Nash is telling Cooper about the weapon, we pan past it for a moment and get a, and we start to hear that phone ringtone. <laughs> yep. I actually had that as my phone ringtone. Mm. I changed it because... Every time my phone rang, my roommate was like, "Dude, you gotta, you gotta get rid of that." <laughs> <laughs> I, was it the Nokia? One of the earlier Nokia's had that as a as a standard, or as a as an option for the ringtone. I, I think it might have. Yeah. Yeah, well, I have that on Motorola, but it was Motorola. Motorola was it. Okay. That was it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, sort of cut inside the aeroplane here, and whether or not this one's able to fly or not, well, we see when Udesky walks out the back, it's got no tail on it, so it's. Uh... 